Welcome back uh, to Life from Paris. And of course, our debate coming up, uh, the second part uh, in a few moments' time. First, the main world news headlines. The U.S. Vice President has landed in Ukraine, a country now more divided and angry after three were killed in a shooting at a pro-Russian checkpoint in the East. Joe Biden is to meet with Kiev's new leaders to discuss further American economic and technical support. Boston runs its marathon in memory of those, of those killed and injured at last year's event. Two bombs were detonated near the finish line, claiming three lives and causing many life-changing injuries. Today's event passed off amid heightened security. Five dead in a mortar blast at Syria's parliament in Damascus as the date for the presidential election is announced. Bashar al-Assad is expected to stand for another seven-year mandate. Voting day is set to be June the 3rd. Welcome back to the uh, France 54 debate. We're talking about Syria. We have many issues to deal with. We've heard from two of the French hostages released after 10 months of mistreatment in captivity held by Islamist extremists. We have our guests uh, here in the studio to comment on that and on where Syria goes next as the presidential election date has been announced. So, our guests here in the studio, Emma Suleiman, former spokesperson of the Syrian National Coalition. Thank you for being with us. On the other side of the studio, and as you'll uh, no doubt learn as time goes by, on the other side of the spectrum, Aysa Midani, board member of the uh, Coordination for the Defense of Syrian national sovereignty. Thank you for being with us. We have guests uh, by Skype joining us from afar. From Marseille, we have Miriam Ben Rad, who's a researcher of the uh, CERI Institute and analyst of the European Council for Foreign Affairs. And also by Skype joining us uh, from uh, Manchester, we have Jonathan Paris, Middle East analyst, a senior fellow of the Atlantic Council of the United States. Jonathan, I've ended with you. I'll start with you to give you a chance to speak. Um, we had a very lively discussion uh, rounding off the, the first part. Uh, two sides completely not agreeing. Um, we're talking about the election now in this second part of the program. Do you think this election in Syria, which is uh, now down for June the 3rd, any possibility of this being like an election as we know it? Just a question addressed to Jonathan or to... To you, uh, Jonathan. Miriam. Yes, to you, sir. To oh, you. yes. Oh, thank you for asking that question. Uh, I think the election in June 3rd will just be like the last one that Assad staged in order to, uh, in a vain attempt to gain legitimacy uh, for his continuing rule. He will not gain legitimacy through this election. It will be a rigged election. Uh, the rebels, the opposition, whatever you want to call them, will not have a fair voice. And uh, it will end with nothing more than a rubber stamp dictatorship uh, using these elections in a vain way to achieve some kind of legitimacy. The only way the elections would be uh, interesting is if Assad stood down and allowed uh, a successor to run, uh, either from the Ba'athist party or the Alawi group or whatever, but it can't be Assad and his family. Aysa, will Bashar al-Assad stand, or as Jonathan suggested, will they make it interesting are, and stand down? Uh, the elections are constitutional, and uh, actually we are applying the constitution. And uh, this, these elections are a popular demand also. And uh, I, I want to remind that uh, all the time the so-called opposition is, was against, the, uh, against elections. You say it's a popular they, demand. They were always uh, against the elections because they know that uh, President Assad will be re-elected. You say it's a popular demand, but with so many yes, people forced from their homes demand. by this violence, by let's they are far from to blame, their homes, but they how can, are how can into it be an election? Syria. How can people vote? They are into Syria, and actually, for the election, there are modalities for to vote outside Syria and inside Syria. Outside Syria, it's the 28th of May, and into Syria, it's the 3rd of June. So these modalities have been decided today, and they have Let been published today. Let me bring in Emma, who is today. not at all convinced. This Emma. is first. And second, oh, I can okay, say... Okay, quickly. Yeah. There are, uh, in fact, displaced people, but about four, four uh, or five million people displaced in Syria, into Syria. So this, uh, they, these people, they can vote. And actually, even displaced people outside of Syria, they can also vote on the 28th of May. Emma, you think it's a sham? <laughs> what are we talking about? Seriously, are we talking about election? Anyway, let's, let's assume 
it's part of the Assad strategy to to get to, to show the people that he's winning, he's legitimate, he's been democratically elected after 43 years. But let's put it this way. Let's talk about the technicality. The technicality. You said a constitutional to offer a constitution that we did not vote to as Syrian and as many millions mm. of Syrian who didn't vote to. But uh, um, to to run for the presidency, you need you need to uh, you need the uh, parliament member, the puppets. 30, you need 30 votes, right? So these people, who would stand against Assad? Let's say they, 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 they elected somebody, okay? How are we going to vote? Especially that he closed down the embassies where you have majority of uh, Syrian opposition. Like, there is not even one single embassy in the U.S. All the Gulf countries where you have the majority of Syrian, you know, in, the, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, uh, all of that, you can't vote anymore. You have to go to Egypt and you can't, as a Syrian, you can't get a visa to Egypt. And then you have the millions of Syrian refugees without any papers. Take me, for instance, in all of Europe, there is no embassy. I don't have any Syrian papers because they were dropped down from me. How do I vote? And who do I vote to? If he opens the nomination tomorrow until May 1st, okay? And the election is quickly after that. Or, come on. I mean, it's a comedy. It's a, it's is, a very funny. Co this we is want a election. Listen, of we want your election. Comedia. Let me finish, please. Let me finish. Yeah. You keep saying that opposition doesn't want election. Since day one of the revolution, we wanted a peaceful transmission, uh, transition of power. What happened? He got us into a civil war. That's he got right. us. He got us all the Islamists, whether Sunnis or Shia, and he got us into. He, he turned it into a chaotic country uh, case, and uh, in addition to the killing I'm and sorry, destruction my and all dear. of that. Let me finish, I let think, me finish. Okay, okay, I thought you finished. So now no, you say we're against election? Of course we are pro-election, but the right election where we can run. For instance, what if I want to run for presidency? How do I How do I run for presidency? I think you are I really, would like to run for presidency. How do really I run for that? You are amazing because you, you don't remember that, uh, first of all, when uh, Jabhat al-Nusra have been listed as a terrorist card... Uh, Jabhat al-Nusra and Hezbollah are let both, me, both terrorists. Both are me, fighting, I didn't fighting on the ground. interrupt you. Please okay. don't interrupt me. Okay. And be a little bit uh, logical and uh, uh, correct in the debate. First, when, uh, when Jabhat al-Nusra have been listed on the terrorist uh, organization, uh, Muaz al-Khatib said, oh, that's really too bad because they are helping us. They are one of us. All A lot of uh, reports of the uh, uh, intelligence services in Germany, in the United States and everywhere, they were always telling that the uh, so-called Syrian Liberation Army is a really uh, empty shell because who the people who are really fighting on the uh, on the ground who are the terrorist organization. Third, when in Geneva too, where we were discussing the discussion, where uh, do you have any? Any contact avec the, with these? Uh, these? Uh, do you have the authority on these uh, extremists? They we said have no. the authority as much as you have the authority on your uh, yeah. on your guys. So, the Hezbollah so, and Iran, so which that, you don't. That Thank was you. <laughs> the message is really it. simple. The message, the message, the message, sorry, sorry, that's it. The message let me, is really let me pause you. Let me bring today, in someone. I've got to stop you now. I'm bringing our guests from. If President Assad was not popular. The Syria would not stay until now, after three years of. Uh, uh, that's of, your opinion. Of, Emma disagrees uh, completely. Let's yeah, bring in Miriam Van Rad of the uh, European Council of Foreign Affairs to talk about the legitimacy, Miriam, yeah. the legitimacy of this uh, election as it stands. We have two people in the studio who completely uh, disagree to disagree. I think that's probably the best way to put it. Um, from a European perspective, uh, looking at what's going to happen on June the 3rd in Syria, mm, how would you describe it? Well, first, I'd like to say that this debate is very emblematic of uh, non-reconcilable Syrian uh, views and the fact that the West or outside actors at large indeed have very uh, limited leverage over the events and uh, the way the crisis has been uh, unfolding. Um, I think that the, the way I mean, it's, it's no longer the Syrian conflict is no longer a two-sided uh, conflict, and I think that the descriptions that, that have been given on both sides do not exactly correspond to some of the dynamics of fragmentation that have been uh, observed uh, both on the regime side and on the opposition one. 
with a fragmentation of the opposition, uh, infighting between jihadist groups, but also uh, phenomenon of insubordination on the regime side, which is uh, quite an interesting uh, development as well. And it's indeed a civil war and now uh, a Syrian affair over which, uh, in my view, the West and Europe uh, in, in particular has a very limited leverage. And especially since the collapse of uh, the, the, the efforts, the French-led efforts uh, to uh, intervene. Um, so um, in this context, uh, as, as we, we can see tonight uh, in, in this debate, we have uh, in my view, irreconcilable um, visions, views of the conflict, uh, which was also illustrated by the collapse of the Geneva II uh, talks. Mm. And uh, indeed, Assad looking for legitimacy, taking advantage of the, of the infighting between uh, opposition groups uh, and also of Russian support, continued Russian support, to show more confidence in his uh, ability to be uh, re-elected. And, uh, and also playing on the fatigue of many Syrians to regain uh, support uh, on, on an internal level. So it's fair to say these elections will neither be free nor fair. Is that what you're saying? Uh, these elections uh, are clearly, uh, I mean, I agree with the fact that these elections will be a parody in many ways. And plus uh, the, the electoral law that was adopted in March, uh, and which informally allows multiple candidates to run includes very, uh, very strong restrictions. Uh, first question of eligibility. Uh, a candidate that would run against Assad would need to have lived uh, 10 years in Syria, 10 consecutive years in Syria, and uh, be born to Syrian parents. And we know uh, and, and, and that you know, many opposition groups under these conditions cannot run for the election. So in that regard, um, in addition to the moral uh, condemnation of, of the Syrian regime, of the Al-Assad regime, we know that uh, these elections are clearly not uh, democratic and taking place in a context of full-blown civil war. So... Mm -hmm. Isa, well, not I democratic, mean. not free, not fair. There's no opposition. No one can stand. Basically, Bashar al-Assad's name's already been elected. I think uh, there is the possibility for uh, other uh, candidates to present themselves, and uh, I think it is, in fact, important to say to recognize today that uh, President Assad. Uh, uh, saved the country, saved Syria, and, uh, and besides uh, fighting against uh, all these, uh, uh, these aggressions, in fact, against terrorism first and against, uh, you I know I that... I won't bring Emma into reply know to that, that one. I'll the bring United in Jonathan States Paris. And yeah. Just to get the another voice, NATO I won't get Emma to reply because I know she's going to disagree Syria. with you. Jonathan Paris, can you hear me? Can yeah. you hear what was yeah. said? And what do you think about Bashar al-Assad having saved Syria? What's your view? Yeah, I think well, so. Well, look, I, I wanted to just to echo Miriam's, Miriam's uh, point about the, the multi-sided nature of this conflict. It is not just a two-sided conflict. Uh, it's very interesting to see that Russia has given real weapons and Hezbollah and Iran, real soldiers, uh, including Shia brigades from Iraq, too, uh, Iran coordinating that, uh, and Hezbollah fighting and dying. I don't see the same kind of sacrifice on the other side, and that could explain why Assad has gotten the upper hand. I think it would be a very big tragedy for Assad to prevail in this civil war. Uh, it, it will reflect very badly on the West, because the West could have done more earlier on, and now they could still do more. But one side is fighting, and the other side is financing or giving moral support or often just talking ambiguously. Um, and I'm afraid that explains why Austin has the upper hand. The election is a farce, but the real thing we have to watch is are the rebels going to be able to prevail in certain areas and keep the stalemate going until they get better funded and better weaponized? Or is Assad going to be allowed to liquidate the opposition? Jonathan, thank you. My guests here, thank you very much for the moment. Let's bring in James Creedon, who, of course, is watching things online for us. Good evening to you, sir. Good evening, uh, Mark. Lively debate here in the studio, yes. which we're always grateful for. Uh, what can you contribute from what's happening online? All right, just a quick look at how uh, the, the French social media has been reacting to the release of these hostages uh, earlier this uh, earlier this weekend, Mark, let's take a look at uh, some reactions from the Europa newsroom. Now, two of those journalists were working for Europa Radio. And what you have here is journalists within the newsroom tweeting 
these images of um, a pretty joyful reunion between the journalists and their former colleagues. You have uh, Edouard Elias and Didier Francois, one taking photographs, because of course he is a photograph, the other apparently making his colleagues laugh, telling jokes. So uh, uh, clearly... Yes, Didier uh, Francois, the, the described as the veteran reporter, seemed like quite a character, didn't he? Right, indeed. And, and you'd uh, need to be to survive what they've been through. Absolutely, absolutely. And here you can see in the same newsroom, Europa taking down the posters which had been up for all of that time, uh, you know, maintaining awareness of the fact that they were hostages. No, no more need for those posters, Mark. Now, um, elsewhere, some journalists uh, have not been participating in the more joyful aspect of this, but have been critical of what they say uh, is uh, as a, a mise en scène, as they say in French, a sort of... A set-up. A set-up. You've got Francois Hollande there welcoming them at the airport. So very much an attempt by politicians to draw attention to the efforts that were made behind the scenes. You could say quite legitimately, right? But what he, what this particular journalist for BFN Television uh, uh, tweeted... Isn't it interesting how these hostage releases always happen at a politically sensitive time? He was essentially suggesting that the timing was fortuitous, the timing was perhaps even planned. Well, now, who, who, who manipulated that then? Is he saying Francois Hollande held them in a shed somewhere in northern France? Well, what he, what he essentially... It sounds I think ridiculous, it was, what it, it was awkwardly uh, written, this tweet, mm. and he very quickly retracted it. So he was criticised for that, criticised for problem, raining on the, the problem parade. of 140 characters, James, isn't it? There you go. You can't develop things, Mark. That's exactly it. Now, elsewhere, cartoon, cartoonists have been having their say as well, reminding Francois Hollande that while four French hostages have been freed, many people are still held hostage to the economic situation in France. Perhaps in bad taste, that one. Well, it's kind of satirically funny. Right, but a, a lot of people keen to remind Francois Hollande, who, who featured centrally in those photographs at the airport, that, you know, this might be good news for him in terms of basking in the glory of this hostage release, but a lot of economic problems. The same, this uh, on the Bakshish, web, Bakshish website saying, well, I hope they go back to work quickly because the unemployment figures are so bad. This might all seem very tasteless, but to explain to viewers just last week, Francois Hollande said, I have no reason to stand for re-election unless I sort out the unemployment situation. So there you go, Mark. Just to finish with this, uh, well, I wasn't actually going to show that, but now that it's up, that's Francois Hollande carrying the cross of unemployment. What I did, that's a plant to cartoon in Le Monde today. What I did want to finish with were these two French hostages. Now, they're not journalists, they were businessmen, still held hostage in Mali. So some people raising awareness about that, that there are still French hostages still held out there. there. Absolutely. Okay. James, thank you very much to you. James Thanks, Martin, with uh, our uh, look at things uh, online. Let's come back to our guests uh, here uh, round the table, uh, Emma Suleiman and uh, Issa uh, Midani. Um, can I just put it to you, five people have been killed today in Damascus. That's every day goes by, more Not people being five, killed. Yeah. More people being killed, people. it's impossible almost to keep count, and isn't it? And children, and they are mm, uh, giving mortar bullets on the, on the, on the schools. And my my uh, question is, couldn't you just and bury these the hatchet people and just make friends and just try and sort this out? Because it seems to me we both want the best for the country, but... Actually, actually, we've been trying to do this since the beginning. There have Sorry. been many conferences, but the problem with pro-Assad, as soon as, as, as we say, we want him out, this is when they shoot us and this is when they shut everything down. I've been, I tried so many times with other groups to open dialogue with you guys, but you never accepted for you, you call him, you call him the platform of the country. What matters for us is Syria, okay? The people. Syria would last, and it's, it's 6,000 or, or even 10,000 years old. Assad is only 43 years old, and he's a dictator. Nobody can deny this. And this is what we're trying to achieve here. Achieve and understanding. I want to tell you something, please. I want to tell you. I have been in the opposition for years, and okay. I am here because, uh, because of that. And in the beginning of the, of the movement, I was uh, for this uh, movement because I thought in the beginning that it was for democracy and, uh, and freedom. And when I discovered that it was for, with, for, with the Muslim Brotherhood, with the, with the terrorists, and with Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and all the Atlantic countries, the NATO countries, I am not going against my country, my dear. I am not against opposition? my country. I don't, I won't be a traitor to my country. Yeah. So now I know that. I know what's, uh, and a lot of people in Syria discovered what was the reality of this. And actually, uh, uh, the United States, France, and, uh, gr and Great Britain are arming and through Saudi Arabia. I wish Arabia, they were arming us. I really wish. Through really Saudi wish Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey. And all these people filtering uh, through 
Turkey through uh, Jordan front borders. What about Iran? And, and the Wh- what about Russia? Lebanese border. I said he's, valid point, but what about Russia arming your side? What about Hezbollah fighting it's with your side? It's not the same thing. This is, is the legitim- the legitimate Emma government disagrees. of Syria. Jonathan Paris is, is calling this, this propaganda. Is I, I only yeah. want to highlight to one Jonathan, go ahead, please. Go ahead, sir. Well, look, I think we're not going to get any kind of uh, solution to this conflict. Uh, I don't even think it's going to be manageable. Uh, I just want to point out that however this conflict ends, there's going to be an immense humanitarian disaster. I wonder whether Syria can ever be put back together, whether all these people who have been internally displaced and, and, and have left the country will ever be you know, back to normal. I think we're, we're really in uh, uncharted territory here. This is one of the worst civil wars in the history of mankind. Jonathan, I saw Midani was talking about Great Britain, the United States, France, she even named François Hollande, saying they were arming yes. uh, the opposition. Um, would you clearly call that propaganda? Would you disagree with that? I, I, dis- I, I, I don't dispute that. I think they, they should have armed them sooner and, and, and better because you have one secret. side with they all the it. arms supported by Russia and Hezbollah, and you have the other <laughs> side with nothing but moral support. I think it, it, it's, it's important that 150,000 people who have died have not died in vain. This is why we were for an inter- This is why we yeah, wanted a, a, a military intervention mm. since the beginning. We would not have reached here. Yeah, sure. And that's it. Come on, and again, uh, like you Libya, guys, you guys you're have the same speech. To, you guys today. have the same carry the same speech. You're very speech. happy with so, Libya. Lost its sovereignty. It's a phase. Sovereignty. It's a phase. You don't go to democracy right away. Uh-huh. You don't. You don't get. You don't get a dictator off uh, out and get a well-shaped democracy. Except it doesn't. It doesn't happen this way. Through colonization, sure. Colonize. This is, why, why this is live, the why democracy live in through colonies. Why do you live in France? Does through it, colonization. It wasn't France a country who colonized your country? Why do you live in France? Yeah. May I ask you that? If you're pro-Assad and you believe, question. you believe in his democracy, why you don't are, you go back to live in you Syria? Are, you are uh, asking for a new colonization I'm asking of you, Syria. I'm asking you. Can this you is, please this is you your answer this question. You can answer this question. Then. Would, you, would you say this that what Bashar Assad was running before? I want to answer this person. Would you say that? We are talking politics. Would you say that? We are not talking about my person. Would you say what Bashar Assad was running before the civil and, war. Would and, you say that sorry, was democracy? I said, I said that France is supporting the terrorism in Syria through Saudi Arabia, through Qatar, and through Turkey also. So all of us and are terrorists for you. All of us, even me. They are supporting terrorist, terrorism in Syria, <laughs> and you are outside anyhow. I was inside. Okay. I think, I I think France would disagree with you. And can I put it to you, as I tried to before, would mm-hmm. you say Bashar al-Assad was running a democracy before the civil conflict began? I don't say democracy. Did these people have nothing to complain Sorry, about? I didn't say it is a democracy. But Syria was progressing and Syria was going very, very fast to democracy. The opening between uh, yeah, 2000 two and mandates, 2011. Two were not Sorry, for please uh, let me continue. I didn't interrupt you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, between 2000 uh-huh. and 2010, Syria was progressing and was opening, but also opening in uh, on all levels. And we were we had more uh, freedom and more freedom of talk and. Uh, uh, and it was progressing. Democracy, it's not course, like this. Okay, well, you don't go from let, a... Let me bring from, back in Jonathan okay. Paris, please. Thank you Jonathan, go ahead. You have a magic, point to make. Uh, go ahead. Touch, huh? Yeah, uh, well, look, I, I think that's the wrong question. I mean, you can have benign authoritarian uh, uh, government. D- democracy isn't the, the litmus test of legitimacy. However, <laughs> to, to you know, Assad is... You know what I call him? Go ahead. He's He's like his family and him. They control like the ATM of the whole country. They control the cash of the country. They can support terrorism. They can do whatever they want with the money. There is no accountability and transparency exactly. in Syria. Mm-hmm. That's the problem. And I think the people wanted to initially wanted to bring bring a change that would remove that kind of um, family rule over the country. It's just ridiculous. I think what the Arab Spring was about was getting rid of these family-ruled uh, uh, dictatorships. And I suppose too many people there have too much to lose, don't they? Conflict. Too many people With have too no much to lose there, don't they? Yeah. Let me bring in Emma Suleiman there. If, if, the, if, the, if the regime changed, if the administration changed, if the country changed, 
as Jonathan was talking about. It's, there will be too many people with too much to lose. That's why exactly. they mounted that's this why, military that's why, response. That's why many people took the regime's side, because they had the ultimate power and money. I mean, we lived, I lived in Syria for a while, and I know how we, we absolutely had, we couldn't do any business. Assad and, and, and his cousins had to be part of this business, and we had to pay briberies and all, and all of that. We had absolutely no freedom of right. No, no, we had no security in a day or uh, we can't even get a lawyer if we're accused of anything. We end up in jail and nobody would know where you are. That's why we had to leave the country and that's why all the, the brains and the smart people left the country and especially the Christian, by the way. And in, in the early 70s, since Assad came in power, they had to leave because they saw a dictatorship coming, uh, whether the Ba'ath Party or the Assad himself, so which, which uh, actually denies the fact that Assad is protecting uh, protecting the minority. It's just another propaganda. Uh, now uh, the conflict is no longer, as your uh, guest said, it's a geopolitical conflict. We really don't have. I think neither me or your guest have anything to say. Assad has his own uh, strategy and uh, PR uh, campaign that he's doing to make his his supporters believe that he's winning militarily, which is no way, no no way he can ever win. I mean, logically, he can't control the country again if he can't. If he couldn't get uh, a small town like Qusayr by himself, he had to get Hezbollah to get it and Yabrud. So militarily, he cannot win, and it's a it's a geopolitical conflict. We're not part of it anymore. We're the victim of it. And this discussion will go on well beyond the uh, parameters of this program. Thank you, Emma Silverman, for your contribution. Thank you, uh, Aisha Midani, for what you had to say Thank from you. the other side of the equation. Thanks to our guests joining us from afar. That's Jonathan Paris joining us uh, from Manchester. Thank you, sir. And thank you also to Miriam Benrad, who, uh, whose contributions were cut short somewhat. But Miriam, thank you very much uh, for what you had to say to us. That concludes our debate here on France 24. Stay with us.